please don't forget guys like share subscribe hit the bell you know it makes sense come on you irons Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, whatever time of day it is, wherever you're watching this around the world. Welcome to Voice from Iron. I am Gatesy, your host, and this is our pre match show ahead of the game later on this afternoon at Molyneux in the Premier League against Wolverhampton Wanderers. Now, just a, a few little things I'm going to go through, my thoughts, my opinions. Now, we've obviously did the opposition recon with the YouTube chat, the Wolves fan YouTube channel, Sweet and Sour Soccer with Scott. He was a very, very good guest. And if you haven't seen that particular stream, I'd recommend you to go back and have a look at it. He was a very articulate man. And he came on and gave his thoughts and opinions on Wolves seasons thus far and about the game that's about to take place. His opinion was that it will be a tough Tough, tough task for, for Wolves. And, and that's pleasing for me to hear as a West Ham fan because the last thing I want to hear is, well, you know, we expect you to roll over and have your tummies tickled and not really be too much of a challenge. So the fact that he has turned around and said that he thinks... He, he actually turned around and said he thinks it will be a 3-1 defeat as far as a scoreline is concerned. So as a West Ham fan, that's exactly what I want to hear. So... This will be, I'm going to give the West Ham, my, my predicted 11 for West Ham first. And there's, there's no real surprises there. And I believe it will be a 4-2-3-1 formation. So the goalkeeper will be Lucas Fabianski. I think Ariola, when he's played, has looked very good. Um, but I think that David Moyes has complete faith and trust in Lucas Fabianski. And to be fair, the presence of Alphonse Ariola has actually kept... Lucas Fabianski's standards pretty high. I know his distribution is still perhaps not as good as we want it to be, but as far as the actual fundamentals of the job of being a goalkeeper is concerned, i.e. making saves and keeping the ball out of the net, by and large, he's done it. We've only sustained two defeats in all competitions um, where he's been between the sticks. Yes, he has. We've, we've conceded the goals. He's conceded the goals in those two defeats. But were they his fault? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Good Al Alphonse Ariola have done better. We'll never know. But he's not made any real big, big mistakes that make me think that he should be taken out. So Lucas Fabianski will start between the sticks. Back four takes care of itself pretty much, I believe, as far as this game is concerned. Aaron Cresswell will be at left back. His deliveries from set pieces will be absolutely crucial. Although we've got other players that are now getting involved in set pieces. I mean, for example, the game against Liverpool for the opening goal. The corner was taken by ja um, Pablo Fornells. We've also got Jared Bowen that can take set pieces as well, corners predominantly. So we've got th at least three players that will start today that can put in set pieces, which, set piece deliveries, which obviously we're quite good exponents of set-piece goals. Um, Centre-half positions will be taken up by Kurt Zuma, and I believe it will be Craig Dawson. Issa Diop, to be fair, when he's played this season, I've actually been quite impressed with him, aside from the opening goal that Joseph Pantsil got for Genk in the Europa League. I looked at Diop in that one and, and thought he didn't exactly cover himself in glory, but, you know, nobody's perfect. Other than that, I actually think he's looked quite good. Um, this season however I think that when Craig Dawson came on for Angelo Ogbonna in the game against Liverpool and obviously we've subsequently heard that Angelo Ogbonna is out for the rest of the season Craig Dawson came on and he, he looked very commanding very assured and didn't really put a frock wrong as far as I'm concerned so he deserves to keep the shirt so he will partner Kurt Zuma in my view right back Ben Johnson, he's got to play. Um, I know that Vladimir Tufel was was excellent last season. His performance levels, the beginning of this season, in my view, they did seem to dip, but not drastically. However, he got the injury. Ben Johnson's come in, and he's, he's really grabbed the opportunity with both hands. I feel that each time he's come in previously, he's kind of thought to himself that, 
it's only a matter of time before the, the the person that he's keeping the shirt warm for will be back and he'll be back on the substitutes bench. This time it looks different. I think this time he's possibly realised, especially with the fact that his contract's up in the summer, although there is an option for an extra two years which the club can activate. I think he's got the opportunity and he's actually thought to himself, I really need to make this place my own. I really need to go all out to make sure that David Moyes has got a massive decision to make when Vladimir Tufal is fit again, which he now is, and Ben Johnson's still in the team, which goes to show you that Ben Johnson's performance levels have been absolutely excellent. The only thing I would say is that possibly he needs to improve on is going forwards. Although, having said that, I, I <laughs> the one thing you could turn around and say is that against that argument, well, Ben Johnson has managed to score a goal this season. In fact, I, th- I believe he's actually got two goals because he got the goal against Brighton, didn't he, last season? So he's got two goals, whereas Vladimir Tufau hasn't actually got any. So... Although, on the one hand, I hear the argument trotted out quite a lot that Vladimir Tufal going forward is better because of the assists that he got last season. But when you look at the goals, that argument kind of falls apart. So Ben Johnson in at right back. Now, ahead of them, Thomas Suchek, no problem at all. He'll he'll be straight in. The one question I do have is Declan Rice. There's There's been some murmurings as to whether there might be a little bit of a fitness concern ahead of this game. Now, I think if Declan Rice is even 80% fit, and when I say fit, the, the, the fitness issue is not a muscle pull or anything like that. It's nothing uh, physical in a, in a sort of muscular sense. But obviously, there was this um, flu that he pulled out with. Um, we're told it's flu, um, not COVID. But he obviously pulled out of the England internationals in the week. Now... If that is the case, then I'm sure it was quite a debilitating illness and all the rest of it, hence him pulling out of the England squad. I'm sure he didn't do that lightly. However, I'm sure that Declan Rice, if he's even 80% fit, if if you know he's got anything to do with it, he'll want to play. David Moyes will want to play him. And he's our captain, he's our heartbeat, he's our standard bearer. So for me, if he's even 80% fit, He's got to play. Now, if he's not, now who would come in? Well, the obvious answers are probably going to be Mark Noble. I would be concerned at that because I'm not too sure. Don't get me wrong. I mean, he's, he's not done bad in the games that he's come in. I mean, Manchester City, I thought he had a good game. Manchester United, I thought he had a good game. But would he? Would this be the game for him? Not entirely convinced it would be. Now, If it's not going to be Mark Noble, the other two candidates, in my opinion, are Alex Crowell. And Alex Crowell, again, I saw him against Manchester United, and I was was impressed with the job he did, in all honesty. But we haven't seen enough of him, so maybe this might be the opportunity to give a few more minutes to him and see how he goes partnering his Czech compatriot. But the player that I'd like to see, if I'm being completely honest, is Manuel Lanzini. I think when Manuel Lanzini has played this season, he has impressed me. He's starting to look like the player that, before he got that bad injury before the World Cup in 2018, Russia, he's starting to look more like that player than he has up to this point. Now, whether he'll ever get back to the the Manuel Lanzini pre-injury, I think it's unlikely. But he's getting there. He's closing the gap between where he is now and where he once was. So, And he played, obviously, in a deep-lying role in the game against Burnley last season when Declan Rice was injured and Manuel Lanzini was put in there. I think it was when Mark Noble then got injured as well. So those two were out and David Moyes was like, who do I put there? He popped Manuel Lanzini in there. He had a sensational game, in my view. But he then got injured in the very next game against Everton. So we didn't see too much more of him in that position. But I think that if I was choosing the team and Declan Rice wasn't available, I think I'd put Manuel Lanzini in there because he's going to keep the possession ticking over. He's going to to dictate the tempo of, of of the match as far as we're concerned. Um, you know, quick passes, you know, he'd be able to sort of pop it off. You know, he's got players around him. He'd be able to pop it off. It won't be a problem to him operating in tight spaces. But as I say, so Declan Rice, if he's he's sort of 80% fit, 
has to play. But if if he's struggling, then I'd personally like to see Manuel Lanzini there. But it could be Alex Crow or Mark Noble. The three ahead of them. Again, these three, by and large, pick themselves. Jared Bowen will be on the right. Now, whether David Moyes will put Pablo Fornals in the 10 position and Saeed Benrahma on the left or the other way round, to be honest, they interchange during the game anyway, so it won't really matter. There'll be one minute where Pablo Fornals will be in the 10 and Ben Rama will be left. And then a little while later, you'll look and you'll see that they've swapped over. So they, they, they do that quite regularly during a match. So it doesn't really matter where you put them. They're, they're pretty effective wherever they go. And then up front, it's, it's the Jamaica's main man, Jamaica's two goal hero in the World Cup qualifiers. Mikhail Antonio, um, his confidence will be sky high. He will be absolutely buzzing after getting those two goals. His first goal from outside the penalty box in about five years or six years, something like that. Um, when I saw that particular stat in, in, in the press during the week, I think they said 54 goals up to that point that he'd scored and they were all inside the penalty box. And then when he gets one from outside the box, which he did against the United States, oh my word, what a goal. Absolutely brilliant goal, superb. So I suppose if you're only going to get one goal in 55 goals now it, for club and country from outside the box, you better make it a spectacular one than he did. So that's the West Ham team. Now, as far as Wolves are concerned, their, their manager that came in, Bruno Large, replacing Nuno, who then went to Tottenham, who has since been relieved of his duties. According to Scott from Sweet and Sour Soccer, it, he's a completely different style of play. Nuno was very much a pragmatist, very much a disciple of um, his former coach at Porto, uh, Jose Mourinho. Now, he um, Bruno Large is, is much more of a, a manager that wants to play on the front foot. So this could be a completely different dynamic to the Wolves that were facing us last season that we managed to beat home and away. So, um, and obviously they've got a new goalkeeper, um, Jose Sarr. So he's also Portuguese, same as Rui Patricio was. However, this guy is a little bit younger. They've brought him in from Olympiacos. He's a Portuguese squad member, although he's yet to get a full international cap. He has played for the under 21s. And yeah, he's six foot four and decent shot stopper, but still early days in the Premier League. So still getting to find out who he is. Um, They'll be going with a back three, although, again, according to Scott from Sweet and Sour Soccer, he thinks that Bruno Large eventually will go to a back four, but he's sticking with a back three for now. And I believe that back three will consist of Roman Saiz, Connor Cody, the captain, and Max Kilman. Now, I'm just going to stop there and focus on Max Kilman because i got to be honest, this is, this is going to be a player I'm going to focus on. Because he was a player until last season I hadn't really heard of. Now, I've done a little bit of digging and some interesting little things that I found out about Max Kilman. First of all, he was born in Chelsea. His parents are Ukrainian. He's actually got Ukrainian parentage. Now, he was a player when he was coming through as an academy player. He was actually on the books of a club very close to where I live right now. Um, he was on the books at Gillingham. He also had a spell at another club that's local to me, Welling United. He played one game and he also then went to play for Maidenhead. He also had a spell out on loan at Marlow. Whilst at Maidenhead, he then got his move to Wolverhampton Wanderers. And in doing so, moving directly from non-league Maidenhead to Premier League Wolverhampton Wanderers, he became the first player to go from non-league to Premier League since Chris Smalling did the same thing when he went to Fulham from another team that's quite close to me, Maidstone United, in 2008, I think it was. Um, he, he also was, he was an exponent of futsal and he actually played for England at futsal. Now, fast forward to the present day and... Andrei Shevchenko, who is the current Ukrainian manager, has made inquiries with FIFA as to his availability. And because he's already represented England at futsal, according to FIFA, he is tied, as far as that is concerned, to England. He can't play football 
for the Ukraine. Uh, so he he's basically he's now his international allegiances are completely and squarely with England. I'm not saying that he's um, England quality just yet, or even if he ever will be, but he's someone that possibly could be down the track on the radar of Gareth Southgate or whoever the manager is of England. But I just found it quite fascinating to find that he was a former non-league player and made the jump straight from non-league to Premier League, which, as I say, hasn't happened before he went in probably about 10 years. So you you see how how infrequently this particular phenomenon happens. So now it could well be that one of those, the, the two either side of Cody, Sais or Kilman, could possibly be moved to one side at the um, for Willy Bowley, who he's starting to come back from his time out of the team. Um, it wouldn't surprise me, but I think that he's going to stick with Sais, Cody and Kilman, and but Bolly will probably be on the bench. In front of them, it will be a four in midfield. They like to operate basically a 3-4-2-1 formation. So... Um, wide left, it will be uh, Ait Nori, Ryan Ait Nori. He's French, although I think he's Algerian descent. Um, he will be uh, the left wing back. Uh, the right wing back will be Nelson Semedo. And then you will have the two central midfielders. Now, um, I, ra- I, I suspect it will be Ruben Neves. In fact, I'm very, pretty confident it will be Ruben Neves. The, his partner, I'm not too sure about. Now, recently, um, his partner has been João Moutinho. Bernard? What's that? Yes, I know it's Jose Mourinho. I asked for João Moutinho. Well, the difference is... One's a player, one's a manager. One's at Wolves and one's at Roma. Thank you. No wonder Milesy and Jazz went and got their own channel. Anyway, so yeah, so I suspect that Jao Moutinho will go, will be dropped down to the bench. He's been a fantastic footballer and a good servant for Wolverhampton Wanderers. But I think that, again, same as with the argument for Mark Noble being in the team, I think possibly there's going to need to be quite a bit of mobility, a bit of legs involved in this particular match for Wolves. So I think that Jmoutinho will drop out and it will be at the expense of Leander Dendonka. Uh, they'll be that, that he'll be the partner for Ruben Neves in the Wolverhampton Wanderers midfield. Ahead of them, the two sort of deep-lying strikers, wingers, whatever whatever you want to call them. Huang He Chan will be to the left of the, the central striker. And he's had a pretty good start to the season, although the last game or two it seems to have tailed off a little bit. But to be fair, he's, he's still a player that a lot of people, Duke included, were quite disappointed didn't come to London Stadium when we had the opportunity in January of uh, this year. So he's come in the bull and he uh, he had a bit of a spell out with his um, previous team, Leipzig, with long COVID. It really hit him, but it seems that he's now recovered from that and he's getting back to the player he was before that, that had a big reputation in the game. Now, his, the player that's going to be alongside him well, it's been Trincao of late, and Trincao, he, I read a stat that said that he is the player that has the highest expected goals in the Premier League that hasn't actually scored as yet. So it kind of makes you think that he's he's not got his shooting boots on, he's maybe a little bit on the wasteful side. So if Trincao doesn't go there, who else could go there? Well, you've got either a Dharma Traore, who... Again, going back to the to the um, opposition recon that Scott did, he, he used a statement, if I remember correctly, that if he could play football, he'd be the best player in the world. Um, but he's he's a player that that I think frustrates you because you can see that he's he should be a better player than what he is. You know, he's quick, he's strong, but 
just his end product. It it just it's very very sporadic. It's very up and down. It's not not consistent, and that's the thing that frustrates a lot of supporters, fellow players, managers. So will it be a Dharma Traore if it's not Trincao? No, I doubt it. I think it will be Daniel Pedenza alongside Huang He Chan, just deep of the central striker, which will be Raúl Jiménez. He will be the number nine up top, the number nine position. And he will be a, an absolute menace to our defence. So we'll need to be on top form. He had a bad injury last season. He, he fractured his skull. And you're never quite sure with that injury whether they will, A, come back for starters. I mean, if you look at the injury, the same injury that Ryan Mason sustained and he never came back. Um, obviously, other players have had fractured skulls like Petr Cech and have made a comeback, although they, they he then spent the rest of his career playing under the helmet, guard, whatever you want to call it. So, um, and I'm never too sure how that affects your peripheral vision, whether you quite can operate in the same way. But be that as it may, again, talking to Scott from Sweet and Sour Soccer, he said that he looks like he's getting back to his best, and if he's anywhere near his best, he, he's an absolute menace. So, yeah, that's what I think the, the, the team will be. That's what I think the formations will be um, at the Molyneux Stadium this afternoon. Now, as always, guys, you might not agree with either one of the uh, team selections or the formations or anything that I've even sort of brought to the table as far as this is concerned. As always, guys, the comments section is down below. Now, for those of you that are long-time viewers of this particular broadcast I've got the little nuggets of information for you so here they are last season West Ham completed our first league double over Wolves since the 1922-23 season we haven't won three league games in a row against them since a run of eight between 1920 and 1958 we haven't won back-to-back -back away game league games against Wolves since a run of three between August 1920 and December 1922. Wolves have won their last two home league games, as many as they had in their previous nine at Molyneux, losing seven. However, Wolves haven't won three in a row at home in the top flight since November 1980. We have won each of our last four Premier League games, the longest current winning run in the competition. We haven't won five top flight games in a row, however, since February 2006 under Alan Pardew. We are unbeaten in 11 away games in all competitions, winning eight and drawing three. Our longest ever solely as a top flight club and the longest in general since March 2004 with 13. We have made just four changes to our starting 11 in the Premier League this season fewer than any other side. Meanwhile, no side has used fewer different players in the Premier League this season than Wolves with 18. Excluding penalties, no side has scored more Premier League goals from set-piece situations this season than us with six. However, Wolves are one of two sides yet to concede from a set-piece this term, along with Manchester City excluding penalties. West Ham's Jared Bowen has scored more Premier League goals against Wolves than he has against any other side in the competition with three. His three goals against them have come in his last two appearances and he averages a goal once every 77 minutes against the Black Country side. West Ham forward Mikel Antonio has faced Wolves without ever scoring more often than he has any other side in his league career. The Jamaican has played 730 minutes across nine different games against Wolves without finding the net. And last factoid, and I touched on this one a little bit earlier, Wolves duo Trincao with three and Adama Traore with 1.9 have the two highest expected goals totals of players yet to score in the Premier League so far this season. So... 
does is that a good thing? I'm not too sure whether it's a good or a bad thing because the the old West Ham fan in me knows that when there's a player that's on a bit of a bad run, can't score, can't hit a cow's ass with a banjo, and West Ham turn up, that's usually the cue for their fortunes to turn. So that that stat I'm a little bit concerned about. But score prediction for me, I'm I'm confident. I don't think it's possibly going to be as easy as people think. Um, I've heard people saying 3-0. Scott said 3-1. I think that it all depends on how fit, how ready Mikel Antonio is um, and also whether Declan Rice plays. I think if one or both of those are out, this could be a completely different match. And don't forget, like I say, this is a new manager that they've got. This is a, a style of play that they're trying to play, which is completely different to how they've played for the past previous four seasons under Nuno. And so I think that this might not be the game that compared to last season that, that we think it is. That being said, I think that our confidence is high in providing Antonio and Rice start and providing they, they're both operating at a very good level. I think we'll have too much for them. And I'm going to go for Wolverhampton Wanderers 1, West Ham United 2. So that's my score prediction for today. And that is where we will end it as far as this broadcast is concerned. So I'd like to thank you very much indeed for staying with me for this last half an hour there or thereabouts going on. Um, for those of you going up to Wolves today, good luck. Hope you enjoy the experience and hope you sing loud. Um, I wish I could be there with you, but it's not to be. But one day I'll get lucky in the ballot. You never know. Um, anyway, guys. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to drop a like on the stream, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon and make sure you share this content onto your social media platform as well. It really does help the channel out tremendously. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Come on, you irons.